Who is ready to talk about some eBPF stuff? Hooray! All right, fabulous, fabulous. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you about some lessons that I learned migrating some modern <sighs> multi-platform eBPF programs. Um, so I am Dave, hello. Um, I work at Red Hat uh, in the office of the CTO, where we do all sorts of things with eBPF, containers, networking, that type of thing. Uh, you may have seen me before at a KubeCon or Linux Plumbers or something talking about a library called Aya, which is a pure Rust uh, eBPF library and allows you to write your eBPF programs in Rust. I'm not talking about that today, though. I've done too much Rust evangelism, and I, I get told that it's boring. Um, I'm also the creator of something called BPF Man, which is a uh, eBPF program manager for Kubernetes that allows you to run your BPF programs in Kubernetes without lots of privileges. But I'm not going to talk to you about that either. No. I'm talking to you about some contributions that I've made to another open source project called Kepler. Who has heard of Kepler? Show your hands. All right, that's about three people in the room, so this is good. It's lucky I've got something in here to explain this. Uh, so Kepler is an acronym. Uh, it's a horrible acronym for Kubernetes-Based Efficient Power Level Exporter. Um, what Kepler is doing uh, is it is getting information about how much power is used by every process on a node. Um, and that is useful if you want to know which applications in your Kubernetes cluster are using the most power, uh, because you want to do something like time of day based scheduling, so you can schedule when your workloads are greener, or if you want to, uh, you have you know carbon regulations. Um, it's very very useful, I'm told. Um, Kepler does a lot of stuff. Um, so much stuff, in fact, that we're just going to focus on this bit in red, because that's the eBPF bit, and that's the bit that I'm most excited about. There is machine learning in here that, uh, where we don't have data, we're able to estimate data to give you that power estimate in the end. There is metrics pipeline in here, but we're, we're just interested in eBPF. So what the Kepler project is doing with eBPF is we have a bunch of PMU events on the CPU, which allow us to measure things like number of CPU cycles used, number of CPU instructions executed, um, uh, cache misses, all sorts of things. And what we're going to do is attach those into eBPF perf event array so they can be read by a probe in the kernel. So whenever our SCED switch K probe gets hit. Uh, we know that a task is going onto the CPU. So we're going to go and read all of these counters to go and find out what the number of instructions were on the CPU uh, at the time this was executed, cycles, etc. And then we're going to go and store that in an array over here. The next event that we're going to read is when a task goes off the CPU, or on, and once we know it's going off the CPU, we're going to do the same thing, but kind of in reverse. So we're going to read the counters. We're now going to read from our array, and then we're going to calculate a delta between when the task went on the CPU and when it's going off the CPU, which will then give us that total number of uh, CPU time or CPU instructions that were executed within that window. And then we'll go and pop that in a hash map so something else can go and read it later. So <clears throat> this is the, the fine-grained implementation details of how we are getting very, very, very precise information about how much CPU time and how many CPU instructions and cycles that a given process on the system was using. Now, those astute uh, observers will have noticed that uh, this will work on anything. So this would work in a virtual machine. This would work on normal Linux. Uh, it's not just about Kubernetes. But obviously, coming back to our acronym, uh, if we drop the K, Epler is just not as catchy. So there we go. So from the user space stand, uh, standpoint, we have that hash map in the kernel, which is going to give us all of our information about all of these processes. And occasionally, uh, once our sample period has elapsed, so three seconds. We're going to go and gather all of the metrics from the kernel, and then we're going to go and spit them out into that metrics pipeline that we're not going to talk about. And the way we do that is we just batch read the whole map. So if we know about 32k processes, we're just going to read 32k entries out of the hash map and go and push that off into the pipeline. So why would we want to change anything? Well, when Kepler started, it was written in BCC. 
Who knows what BCC is? All right, that's more than three people, so that's wonderful. Um, so BCC uh, is the BPF compiler collection. Very cool uh, way of writing your BPF programs in a write once, run anywhere type of environment. Now, what this means for Kepler is that at compile time, we have our application binary. And within that application binary, we have the source code of the eBPF probe. When we go to run that thing, then what happens is within the BCC library, our source code gets spat out to LLVM, which then goes, turns the source code into object code, which then goes and passes the object code to libbpf, which then loads the object code into the kernel. Now, what's very cool about this is that it gives us portability insofar as whatever the runtime target is, we are going to know that our BPF program is going to work on it because we've compiled it specifically to work on that platform. But there are downsides. Um, when we were packaging uh, Kepler with its BCC-based uh, probe implementation, we noticed that the dependencies were kind of big. Um, so if you were to install BCC, uh, it's around about 217 meg unpacked um, because it uses libllvm and libclang, which are fairly large. Um, so that meant that we, we kind of had a rather large package. Um, so we wanted to reduce that as much as possible. The only way to do that is to move from compiling on the target system uh, at runtime to compiling ahead of time which leads us to why we might want to go down a, a libbpf-only approach. So the flow in libbpf is a little bit different. So at compile time, we now have two artifacts. Um, you could put them both together, but we'll just imagine them as two. Uh, we have our application binary, which runs in user land, and then we have our ebpf object file. Uh, and at runtime, there is no compilation phase anymore. We just let, give that straight to uh, libbpf. Libbpf can then go pop that into the kernel. Now, the compromise here is that running anywhere requires some assembly uh, from, the, uh, from the program author. Uh, not assembly as in uh, assembly, uh, ASM code, but you, you are required to take additional steps. Uh, so if you are using k-probes or trace points or something, you may be familiar with uh, vmlinux.h, which is generated from the kernel debug info uh, that gives us very nice uh, mappings to all of the data structures there that we could potentially use. Now, the problem is vmlinux is architecture specific, so we need to make sure that we've got one of these for every target architecture that we could potentially be targeting. And with Kepler, it was at least four. Um, that we had to uh, take care of. Each one of these VM Linux files is three meg each, and they were all checked in uh, to source code uh, in our repository. Um, this raised my eyebrows. Um, because they are big files, for one, but for two, there was no information about how they got there, who made them, what kernel version they were generated on. Um, we had to then sort of conditionally include each one of these based on the target platform when we were doing compilation. And yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't ideal. Um, so like I said, vmlin, uh, vmlinux.h, built from the BTF of the running kernel, contains important type defs for things like ptreg, for the CPU registers on the target system, which are useful if you're working with trace point objects and k-probes and things like that, um, and Cori type defs for all the structs using the kernel. So if you want to use task struct or something, it's going to be there. You don't need to write your own one. All very simple. So, modernization. When we started out, um, when I came into the project, there was already a, um, a port from BCC to libbpf uh, in process. And that revolved around uh, a complete rewrite. I say rewrite, it was more like copy paste and then change some things until it compiles of the BCC probes um, over to uh, something which works with libbpf. Uh, and then the choice was made to use libbpf go as the go library of choice um, because in the background uh, it uh, uses libbpf. Um, there were a few other things to mention here about this when I started poking around the code. Um, we had these artisan handcrafted data structures 
that allowed the Go code to read the uh, data that was in the eBPF map. So it was a uh, exercise for the developer to ensure that what was in the kernel code actually mapped up with what was in the Go code. It used Go, um, which was slow, uh, but also from a build standpoint, uh, the builds took longer, uh, and our build environment became very specific. We needed to have a very specific version of libbpf static available uh, at build time, which meant trying to get people to build the project was uh, increasingly difficult. That was make file magic uh, that made all of this come together. And we were loading um, the object file from some arbitrary location on disk. Um, and because of all of the VM Linux magic, it, it wasn't particularly portable. Um, so on our kernel side, we had our K probes, we had our trace points, and we had all of this big VM Linux stuff checked into the repository. So where we wanted to go was we were going to make some changes. So on the kernel side, we're going to make some changes, and hopefully we're going to get rid of that VM Linux stuff. On the user space side, we're going to make some changes as well. Uh, we're going to potentially look at changing the eBPF library used uh, to get rid of the uh, <coughs> handcrafted stuff and make that auto-generated, to get rid of the CGO and have something that runs in pure Go, um, to get rid of the make file magic and have something which is simple and easier to understand for a Go developer, to embed the ELF file inside the binary so we don't have two things to ship around everywhere, which means a build on my machine, I should be able to go and SCP off to a, a test server, run it, uh, and it will just work, and hopefully get to a situation where uh, we have uh, a much more portable eBPF code base. So by modern, uh, we set a bar and said kernel 5.12 is going to be the lowest that we're going to support. Um, which is a, a long-term-ish supported kernel, at least, or there's a, an LTS near there. Um, and for multi-platform, what we wanted was just two variants of our eBPF probe, one that's little Endian and one that's big Endian. Those are the only two variants that we should ever need. Uh, we still do need one binary per platform, but from the eBPF side, things are so much simpler than having to have an eBPF probe for every target architecture and potentially for different kernel versions on different target architectures as well. So we made some changes on the eBPF side. We looked at the K probes that we were using, and it became immediately obvious that we didn't have to use K probes. Uh, we could use trace points. Um, there were some advantages to trace points that uh, they don't change. Uh, the ABI is stable, so uh, the kernel can continue to uh, evolve, and our trace points will just work. And since the format is well defined, uh, we shouldn't need to worry about the VM Linux.h anymore. Uh, we can just write the, the little bits of code that we need to deal with that. Everything should just work fine. Uh, the only con to doing this is that one of the places that we were using K probe didn't have a trace point but that's fine, we'll, we'll cover that later. So removing VM Linux.h was fairly trivial. If you head into uh, syskernel tracing events, you can go and get the format of all the trace points on the system, and there, there's a, a little section at the beginning that says, common stuff, do not read this. Um, you need to start reading after the first, uh, you know, <coughs> the first field starts here, basically. And if you go and look all over the internet, you'll find a pattern that looks like this. Unsigned long pad, you know, we just won't touch that first eight bytes. Now, <clears throat> this is fine, right? Because that, that's never going to not be eight bytes. Um, I made the changes. I felt really chuffed. Um, shipped a new version, and suddenly we started getting bug reports of, do you know this isn't working on RHEL? Now, when they say not working, it loaded into the kernel just fine, um, but all of the values that were getting uh, added for CPU time, they were just garbage. Now, I was confused, um, but we started doing some digging, and we found out that on not rel, um, offset is eight, which is what we expected. But on rel, offset is 12. 
and 12 is not 8. So all of our reads were off, um, causing our probe to just not work catastrophically, which is, is quite awful, really. Um, and this all turns out that in RHEL, uh, some work was done to merge the real-time patches with the kernel. So we have one version in RHEL, so things are slightly different here. And it's incredibly annoying, because now my trace point doesn't work. Now, if we'd have stuck, sorry, coming back here a minute, if we'd have stuck with vm.linux.h, this would have probably been fine, because that structure at the beginning, that trace entry one, um, that, that would have automatically updated itself. But because we removed VM Linux, we kind of fell into a trap. But it turns out the uh, kernel does continue to evolve. And there have been at least two uh, large increments to trace points since then. We've had raw trace points. And my favorite, BTF enabled raw trace points. Now, these are like trace points, but better, because they are faster. They are stable enough, because we have BTF that allows us to do all sorts of cool trickery to make sure that the things that we want to read are available for us to read. Um, and they're pretty easy to work with. But more importantly, they don't have the same issue as the trace points did originally. So I made the change again. And now everything was working. Um, to do that, we are using Tarstruct, um, but we're using our own sort of compressed version of Tarstruct. If anybody has seen Tarstruct in the kernel, they will know that it is humongously long. Uh, and here, we only care about PID. Uh, so our Tarstruct only has PID in it, and Corey takes care of doing all of the relocations for us to make sure that we just read PID. As we found out, though, we also wanted to read the state field. And it turns out that that field managed to get itself renamed sometime in the kernel from state to underscore underscore state, which was a little bit annoying, to say the least. But thanks to Corey, uh, we were able to get around this by defining ourselves two intermediate structs, one task struct old and one task struct new. Uh, and then we're able to just try uh, and use this helper, BPF core field exists. If it's the old one, use the old version. If it's a new one, use the new version. Our program compiles, passes the verifier, all the relocations happen, and everything is amazing. So Corey is awesome. And with these custom Corey types, we don't need to worry about VM Linux. Now, for the one case where we didn't have a trace point, we could use fexit, uh, which allows us to hook into the kernel function. Uh, the nice thing about this was we didn't need to read anything from the context at all. We just needed to know when that thing happened. This isn't a solution for everybody, but it was a solution for us. Which then brings us to how that changed the current state. At this point, we've got our BTF trace points, our fexit, our own Cori type definitions, and all that VM Linux code is gone. The only thing we need to do now is take a look at what's happening in user land. So in summary, vmlinux.h means one probe for every architecture, and potentially versions of kernel if you have that kind of state and dash dash underscore state situation. Um, trace points are only stable if you use vmlinux.h. Don't fall into that trap. And using BTF trace points, fexit, and custom Cori types fixed it. Now, for the uh, user space portion, uh, we moved from libbpf go to the Cilium eBPF library. Uh, what Cilium eBPF gave us was the fact that it's pure Go, no C Go involved at all. Uh, there is a very cool tool inside uh, the Cilium eBPF ecosystem called bpf to go that allows us to use Go Generate to compile our BPF bytecode. Uh, it also uh, embeds the bytecode into our binary, which solves our, our packaging problem. And it also auto-generates data structures for dealing with our eBPF maps. So this basically solves 99% of my issues with the uh, previous code, just from changing the, the library from one to the other. We now have only two object files. And I can just use go build with go os and go arch. Uh, and everything just works. So if I want one for MIPS or I want one for risk five, I just put in the necessary things. Um, and then suddenly, I've got a binary which can target the right platform. So this was really, really easy to do uh, cross builds with. Um, as part of the auto generation, we found a bug or a feature. Um, if you look at our, uh, our, our code on the left-hand side, you'll notice that PID is the first field and uh, TGID is the second field. Uh, but if you look on the right-hand side, uh, that's reversed. Um, there are reasons for this, uh, because the kernel sees uh, process IDs and task IDs differently. Um, and we had to, uh, 
we had to switch those around uh, to make sense if you're looking from user space. Uh, the only problem was we were switching that around in one too many places. So we switched it around in the C code, and then we switched it around when it came from uh, the eBPF stuff over to our, uh, uh, our metrics collector. Um, so having that auto generation there saved us uh, from ourselves, um, and it fixed a bug. So just doing that migration, um, we now got our auto-generated uh, data structures, no Seago, simplified build, embedded ELF in binary, and uh, now completely portable eBPF probes, uh, which we were very happy about. I know I'm running very close up to uh, time, so uh, I did have a but wait, there's more section, so I will just buzz through that very quickly uh, because uh, aside from uh, some of the more obvious features of Cilium eBPF, there were at least three that uh, we found that were really, really cool uh, and felt worth mentioning. Um, the first one is that we can now unit test our eBPF code. Now, this is really cool because we can create a dummy function um, to test out my do Kepler sked switch trace, um, and I can make sure that uh, this returns as it should do. So this function changes some maps. Uh, I can write some assertions to make sure that the, the data in those maps have indeed been changed in the way I was expecting, which is another great way of avoiding bugs. Uh, we can do eBPF benchmarking, uh, thanks again to Cilium eBPF, because it uh, integrates very well with Go testing and Go benchmark frameworks, uh, which allowed us to benchmark our eBPF probe, uh, find out that it was running in about 2.8 microseconds-ish, which seems like an, uh, a forever if you're uh, looking at uh, things in the kernel. Um, and using that, we were able then to open this up in the profiler, dig through, find the hotspots, and make some changes uh, to end up with a more efficient probe in the end. And lastly, I had a crazy idea about, instead of doing the batch read that we were doing previously of these potentially 32,000 events, could we just like stream them as they happened over to user space and have user space just deal with all of the summarization? Now, Cilium eBPF has support for ring buffer, which is wonderful. Um, so, <clears throat> in its default configuration, though, uh, we end up hitting 100% CPU uh, because there were just too many events coming in from the kernel over to user land, and uh, yeah, we needed to tune that thing. Um, tuning a ring buffer is black magic. Um, if anybody has done this successfully, please come and find me. Um, there, there were too many knobs to tune. Uh, the ring buffer size, the notification batch size, on our go side, um, how many, uh, <coughs> what sort of buffering we had set up there, how many go routines we were using to process events. Uh, it was turning into a bit of a nightmare to get uh, values. We were changing one of these at a the time, running a sample, uh, seeing if that changed, running it again. Um, however, uh, Cilium eBPF uh, kindly accepted the patch from me to uh, add um, a way of getting metrics from the ring buffer uh, so that we can now in real time see how much available data is in the ring buffer, which makes tuning things a little bit easier. I still haven't got to the point where it's working efficiently, uh, at least you know hitting the sort of 1% to 3% user land CPU sweet spot that I'm looking for, uh, but it's certainly trending in the right direction. All right, so other benefits. Unit testing is awesome. Uh, benchmarking lets us validate our probes run within acceptable parameters. And ring buffer could be very exciting if I ever get it working. All right, that is the end of my talk. Thank you for paying attention.